Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityurma Amritam Gamaya Om Shanti 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 Om lead us from the unreal to the real lead us from darkness unto light lead us from death to immortality Om Peace, peace, peace. So I'll request Diane to read out the questions. Uh, the first question is from Ranjani R. I have been reading about Vedanta for the last 15 years. While the Vedantic teachings resonate with modern psychology and modern physics, I've been unable to draw from the teachings for a sociological understanding of the human condition. The subject of inquiry is the self, but what is its relation to the society while one inhabits the body and this world? How are ideas of justice and equality contemplated in Vedanta? Many explain away the injustices in the world through notions of maya or karma, but that seems to me to be lacking compassion and empathy. What is this impulse of justice and what is its place in the pursuit of truth? How does one grapple with such high philosophy and scriptures that also condone caste or gender-based violence? Must they be seen as individual human actors acting from a place of pain or weakness alone when there are social or cultural basis for them? Is there something in between the microcosm and the macrocosm, the individual and cosmic self, that might shed light on the social and political predicaments that our world faces? Yes, that's um, a very good question, actually. It relates to suffering as we find it, especially in society um, through the centuries. So what does Vedanta have to say about that? Why Vedanta alone? All spiritual systems are actually about this. Though you may think that it's about some personal quest for nirvana, for enlightenment. Um, what about injustices in society? What about poverty and inequalities and gender-based uh, um, discrimination, caste and race-based discrimination? What about all that? And what does Vedanta have to say about that? There, there seems to be a disconnect. But there actually isn't. The whole purpose of Vedanta is to overcome suffering. And in suffering, Vedanta does not make a discrimination. That it has to be only my personal particular kind of suffering and there are other kinds of suffering which we are not dealing with. No. Suffering as a whole. The Buddha, uh, the Buddha's case is very clear. Why did the prince renounce his luxurious life and go away in quest of what? Um, the truth or whatever it is, but what would be the, what is the purpose of it? What was the goal of it? The goal was overcoming suffering and note The Prince Siddhartha was not in suffering uh, He had a pretty good life actually But he saw the pervasive nature of suffering that everybody suffers all people old age and um, and sickness and death and then one day it would affect him too so his quest was to overcome suffering in its most general form. And that is the quest of all spirituality. The Sankhya system, Swami Vivekananda calls it the oldest philosophy of humanity. The Sankhya system starts Sankhya Sutra, uh, the Sankhya Karika of Ishwar Krishna. The first Karika, the first verse starts with that there is a quest to overcome suffering, afflicted by the threefold suffering. Um, uh, humanity sets out in a quest for overcoming suffering and very soon noticing that the worldly means of overcoming suffering are not working then there's a quest a spiritual quest for overcoming suffering I can't put it any better than that uh, that means when you realize that all the obvious means of overcoming suffering 
medicine for illness and if you're bored there is tv and if uh, um, so uh, all the worldly means of overcoming suffering uh, atyantika uh, atyantika aikantika bhavat that there is no there is no ultimate solution for suffering in all of these ways then the spiritual quest starts so the spiritual quest in whatever language in whatever mythology uh, sometimes it is in the language of myth and sometimes it's in the highest very sophisticated philosophy but the purpose is always the same to overcome suffering now down to the the specific question the response of Ved- vedanta to systemic suffer uh, injustice suffering caused by systemic problems by systemic problems what she has pointed out uh, is um, uh, for example the uh, you know discrimination based on race uh, persecution based on gender and uh, inequalities gender and poverty and, uh, so uh, all of these things which are not just personal they are pervasive in society uh, they are problems which have developed over centuries in society and have become uh, endemic to society and religions one must not uh, evade the issue or sweep it under the carpet religions also have internalized these structures religions are also organizations they are part of society so they also internalize these existing injustices in society and they, these things have to be rooted out so are we to as she says explain it away as karma or as uh, sin um, or as maya uh, or are we to deal with it squarely so vedantic response to this kind of suffering systemic suffering you find in swami vivekananda for example uh, swami vivekananda was most uh, severe in his criticism of uh, uh, of caste based discrimination the discrimination against women um, he said the downfall of india is due to two great national sins one is the uh, neglect of women and the other is the oppression of the masses he says it very clearly uh, swami vivekananda when he was in the west he stoutly defended india and uh, indian religions against criticism in the west but when he went back to india if you see his lectures from colombo to almora when he crossed from the south of india till uh, from sri lanka actually he started and went to the north of india giving talks all the way up there uh, he was most severe on his own countrymen against superstition uh, against um, the patriarchy against casteism uh, against weakness and uh, uh, so disunity all of these problems a lack of education so all of these he took up and he um uh, he urged his countrymen to awake and to deal with these problems uh, he says most in, in his rousing call he says uh, i do not care for the religion which cannot give the hungry man a loaf of bread here or wipe the widow's tears and promises heaven afterwards he says i do not care for for such a religion so he he was he was very forthright about this a true religion must deal with uh, problems here now if th- what about systemic oppression caste gender uh, inequalities when you see such things you must deal with it each uh, generation has to face uh, uh, its own challenge in this regard the society is dynamic it's changing so the so the problems that Uh, where they are in the late 19th century in india are not the problems in 21st century in manhattan but similar problems are always there there are always the strong who oppress the weak the rich who oppress the poor so swami vivekananda uh, he said a part of religion a strong uh, an important part of spirituality is to is to fight this so do you have to be activists and social justice warriors to be vedantins not necessarily you cannot make a rule about this if you feel called to it you must as i like to say there is no private spirituality private spirituality is no spirituality by by that i mean i will be spiritual i will be peaceful i will meditate and have a peace of mind and i will be enlightened like the buddha but i don't care about others 
uh, if they want to be spiritual well and good for them if they don't want to be well they will take the hindmost i i don't care about that that kind of attitude towards spirituality it does not take one very far very soon one realizes that um one is not even achieving one's own private spiritual goals by by being like that by looking away from society so nowadays if you look the ramakrishna order for example and and many of the new why just the new even the more ancient vedantic orders uh, back to the uh, the shankaracharyas of the different peters in uh, uh, india you find that we are very engaged in india if you look at the ramakrishna order uh, right now uh, the ashrams are providing relief uh, to those affected by the pandemic uh to those affected by the uh, super cyclones which hit hit india wherever there is poverty wherever there is great suffering um so the monks are there to help suffering humanity uh, to provide food to the hungry to provide education to the ign- uh, ignorant and uh, provide spiritual knowledge to everybody so this has been this is the response of vedanta to um to the systemic kind of injustice and the suffering that it imposes on humanity um and it's not frozen because it's sort of open architecture vedanta if you are reading vedanta for the last 15 years now bring that knowledge to bear on the problems of society that are apparent to you what does vedanta say if all beings are one how do i respond to the sufferings of others if they are one with me the way i would respond to my own sufferings that we have to respond to the sufferings of others and not just a private effort when you see that it's built that there's uh, evil built into the very structure of society uh, because of hist- history maybe it has just crept into society and societies are uh, they are very complex creatures so they degenerate over time and they have to be reformed if you feel that then uh, one must take up uh, one must um, uh, fight against uh, evil and misery where, wherever one finds it when you are, you have to be called to it a note of caution here i was um, i'm reminded of a humorous incident many many years ago when swami shivananda was the president he was the second president of our order uh, it was this was in the 1920s um a, a certain gentleman a devotee used to visit belur math and he visited swami shivananda and uh, they were having a conversation uh, remember at that time the uh, mahatma gandhi was fighting against the british for the independence of india so there was a nonviolent struggle going on for indian independence and lots of young people were giving up their college education their careers and joining the national struggle for freedom and many of the parents were against it so uh, this gentleman was saying to swami shivananda look the all the trouble that mahatma gandhi is kicking up and these youngsters they're so irresponsible they don't they're not doing their duty and they're not uh, you know completing their studies and they're not taking up jobs and they're just going and uh, joining this national struggle uh, whatever it is it's it's all just so much of a fuss or over over nothing swami shivananda kept quiet um and then a few days later the gentleman visited and there was a young man who had come to become a monk so he was passing by and he bowed down to swami shivanand and walked walked past and this gentleman looked at that and then so he told swami shivanand you know when the whole country is in an uproar for the fight for national independence is it right for this young man to give up all responsibilities and become a monk and uh, uh, you know join the ramakrishna order and just you know meditate and pray it's the height of uh, escapism then swami shivananda couldn't take it anymore he turned to the gentleman he said um, softly but firmly look mahatma gandhi who is immensely busy with the freedom struggle of india uh, but he is happy he is at peace you can clearly see he is at peace and joy and this young man he has given up the world he has given up all possibility of worldly enjoyments and his only goal is enlightenment and god realization he is at peace he is happy the only one who is not happy is you <laughs> you are neither engaged in any great uh, you know national or social cause 
neither are you engaged in a serious uh, search for uh, self realization so yeah so that must be we must take action whatever you are called to do the vedanta gives you a wonderful philosophy uh, a framework for that action whether it be uh, inquiry into the self or uh, to overcome to to serve suffering humanity in whatever form you find it which one should we do why not do both why not do both have the best of both worlds swami vivekananda's great motto atmano mokshartham jagat hitaya cha for your own liberation and for the welfare of the world so every monk of the order is engaged in meditation in vedantic study and inquiry in devotional practices but also in service service of the the living god by giving food to the hungry or education to the uh, those who need it and spiritual knowledge to everybody so what a wonderful philosophy of life that you reach the highest possible goal in uh, human civilization that we have had uh, is enlightenment and at the same time your life is of immense benefit to all those around you yes the second question is from jaya s we are taught that body identification i.e. ignorance of our true nature as atma is a source of samsara what are some aids to drop body identification once one understands at the intellectual level that one is not the body through study and practice of the sadhanas prescribed so the question is about sadhana spiritual practice that how do we drop this body identification this identification with the body is uh, our, is the cause of samsara and the cause of suffering so how do you drop the body identification wouldn't it be nice if i felt i was some kind of glow of consciousness and the miserable body went its own way and uh, i am safe from it um first of all you notice in the question that she is uh, asking uh, it is after intellectual conviction i have studied it and i have understood it but how do i reduce the body identification well the first thing is to know that you are not the body is to have clarity in what sense am i not the body the body is there you are experiencing it but if you are experiencing it you are not the body by all the vedantic um, uh, inquiry the vichara which she says she has already studied and she understands if it's an object just as this clock is an object and nobody says i don't say i am the clock it's a clock it's different from me i'm aware of it but just because i'm aware of it doesn't mean that i'm a clock similarly i'm aware of the body i can see it i can uh, hear it if my tummy rumbles and uh, i can touch it smell it so it's i'm aware of this body very much aware of the presence of the body but that does not mean i am the body immediately the question will come that oh if if somebody knocks the uh, clock you have no problem but if somebody comes and punches the body then you have a problem it hurts yeah. so th- there is a visceral reaction to what happens to the body the sickness in the body and it's terrible body is tired and, and diseased and then then we are constantly suffering it's not enough to say i am aware of it so i am not it and therefore the problem is solved but notice follow this method a little further we say if somebody punches the body or the bo- little there's a burn in the body it hurts or disease it it's miserable it's it's uh, hurting painful that hurt that pain that misery are we aware of it and the answer will be of course most intensely i wish i was not aware of it that's why we take painkillers and anesthesia and all of that but i'm aware of it that's why i'm suffering i'm aware of misery of pain and of tiredness and of um, all kinds of bodily problems but then it the same thing applies i am not the clock because i'm aware of the clock i am not the body because i'm aware of the body it's an object of awareness not me not the subject similarly on a subtle level the pain the misery the the trouble that the body is causing if i am aware of it then i am not it it may sound strange when you put it that way but if you look actually look it begins to make sense when i was first reading this i would pinch myself so don't do any kind of self harm that's very dangerous but i would pinch myself and see okay there is the pain 
Now, just as I'm aware of the hand, am I aware, am I aware of the pain of the hand? Yes. And when you are, when you see that, somehow, miraculously, the pain is not so painful. It becomes a feeling, a neutral feeling. Pain is a message sent by our nerve, nerve receptors that something is going wrong and something needs attention. That's all it is. So even the pain and the misery, if you feel it, it's an object. It's not you. Ah, but it's my pain. Is it? Did you make it? Do you own it? Do you have the papers for it? Does it obey you? No. It's an object of awareness which appears like all other objects of awareness, follows its own internal logic and disappears. So this is the first thing. You realize, I am not the body. It is not even my body, whatever that means. Similarly, I am not the pain, the suffering. Not even, it's not even my pain or suffering. It is pain or suffering, just an object. I am not even the thoughts. I am aware of the thoughts and therefore I am not the thoughts. All right. Will this work to reduce body identification? Unfortunately, no. Unless one is already a very advanced sadhaka, spiritual seeker. This kind of logic is soothing. It is illuminating. Uh, it is interesting. But day-to-day -day life, it won't work. Yeah. So, I'm, uh, Sri Ramakrishna would say, when you can, just all, you can say all you want that I am not the body, I am the Atman. But when the thorn pricks and you shout involuntarily, ouch! So what will help? In addition to this knowledge, as a foundation for this knowledge, in addition as a foundation only because we are weak, we are not yet ready, that's why. As a foundation for this knowledge, the sadhanas, first of all moral and ethical life. Immoral life, indisciplined life has one terrible consequence. It ties us ever more deeply with this limited body and mind. Moral and ethical life brings the body and mind under discipline. Unselfish life. The more we are concerned with the um, sufferings and how to help others, sufferings of others, the welfare of others, what can I do for you? The less time we have to think about our own little petty problems. That's why people uh, who are engaged in great causes, they are often very ascetic in their own lifestyle. Not because they are practicing asceticism, because they have no time, and they have no energy. It could be somebody like, say I mentioned the freedom fighters in India, Mahatma Gandhi and others. Or it could be a scientist or a creative person who is so immersed in research or writing a, a book. Uh, there is... Uh, very little time and energy and attention to give to the body and its needs. Yeah. So, unselfish life. Another very powerful aid to reduce body identification is devotion to God. Immense love of God, where the whole mind, attention and emotions flow to the, to the beloved. That my Krishna, not my body, my Krishna, my Rama, my Divine Mother. So the attention is not towards the body. And meditation. In meditation, it's not possible in the early stages, but as we advance, in meditation one loses sight. Attention moves away from the body. From the world outside, from the body also. And quietens the mind, quietens the sensory system. Do not take in data from outside. The mind quietens down and your attention moves away from the body to the object of your meditation. It could simply be an awareness meditation. It could be a focus on a deity, a deity visualization meditation. Uh, many different forms of meditation are there. But in all the cases of meditation, they serve to reduce body identification. So these are some of the practices which help us, powerful practices, which help us to um, reduce body identification. Then Vedanta works directly. You actually, it becomes a living realization. I am really not the body. The sufferings of the body are not my sufferings. Why should I suffer along with the body? I'm quoting from the Upanishads. Uh, um, Why should I be fevered along with this feverish body? So this kind of honest experience that yes, it is like that. And the sufferings of the body are not my sufferings. 
Uh, that is possible uh, when the mind is prepared by these uh, by these sadhanas. Uh, Bhagavad Gita says the, the uh, why it, Vedanta is not directly effective. Why don't we directly feel after understanding that I'm not the body mind? Why don't we directly feel and this problem is solved? I'm liberated. Why not? Uh, so the Gita says. Um, Avyakta hi gatir dukham dehavad bhiravapyate. The unmani path of the unmanifest, path of the the uh, attributeless Brahman, that I am pure being, a pure awareness. It sounds cool and sounds very, uh, very, very philosophical, very sophisticated, very profound, but it's difficult. Gatir dukha is very difficult to attain. For whom? Dehavad bhi literally means that those who have bodied, those who are embodied. But immediately if you think about it, that can't be true. Even the Jivan Muktas, those who are enlightened, whether Sri Ramakrishna or Vivekananda, the Holy Mother or uh, the direct disciples, uh, many other great Jivan Muktas, uh, em free while embodied in the body. So they also, there is also a body, whether they think they are the body or not, that's a different thing. But we do see that there is a body. So why is Vedanta working for them and not for me? So embodied here does not mean just the presence of a body. It means identification with the body. A strong feeling, I am this and this is me. Technically this is called Anyonya Dhyasa. Who am I? This. What is this? Me. It's, it is I. So this mutual superimposition, I on the body and the body on me. This is called uh, adhyasa or superimposition. And this is a, just a technical way of saying identification with the body. This prevents Vedanta from working. All right. This question is from Abhya H. Greetings, Swamiji. I have seen many videos of your lectures on YouTube, and they have helped me very much in my spiritual journey. As I have been raised as a Muslim, I know Islam very well. In the Quran, Prophet Muhammad has said that he is the best and last messenger of Allah. Buddha, Shankar Shankacharya, Sri Ramakrishna, all of them are enlightened. So what's the difference between them and the Prophet? Why has God given such a statement in the Quran? Please, Swamiji, I will be really grateful if you can answer my question. All right, so this is a question from an Islamic perspective um, where it says that the Prophet Muhammad is the last of the uh, prophets. Uh, it's called the seal of the prophets. So there are no more prophets after the Prophet Muhammad. Now, what does that mean? Um, a direct answer first, then we'll explore a little more. The direct answer here is, I actually met um, a gentleman who was an who is very well versed in the Quran and is a great devotee of Sri Ramakrishna and in fact he's a monk of our order. He's a Muslim from Iraq. Uh, so he became a monk of our order and a great devotee of Sri Ramakrishna. So I asked him, how do you reconcile your devotion to Sri Ramakrishna mm -hmm. uh, with what the Quran says that the Prophet Muhammad is the last prophet? And his answer was, oh, that means, that statement means the last of the Abrahamic prophets. The last of the Abrahamic prophets. So that was his answer. That does not mean that Sri Ramakrishna is not an avatar or other incarnations cannot come afterwards. They can come. But that particular lineage of prophets, the final one is Prophet Muhammad. So that's the meaning. Now, later on I saw that's exactly the interpretation of the Quran itself. The Quran itself explains Adam was the first and Muhammad is the last. So the Abrahamic prophets comes to an end, that a particular lineage comes to an end. Now you will say that's an interpretation. Yes, that's an interpretation. Yeah. You have to find your own interpretation. The best way of interpreting is first of all trying to interpret within the text itself. So the text says, the Quran says this, and what else does the Quran say? And which, by which you can understand this statement. The Quran says Prophet Muhammad is the last prophet, and then it says Adam was the first, Muhammad is the last. Oh, you put two and two together and say, Okay, in the uh, Ab Abrahamic religions, um, the uh, Prophet Muhammad is the last of that kind of teacher, of prophet. Mm -hmm. So this is the answer. A little more general, let's step back and take a more synoptic view. In every religion, um, since ancient times, 
there have been extraordinary persons. You see, some religions like Hinduism and Christianity, they accept incarnation. Now I'm not going to uh, make draw fine distinctions between the avatar a concept in uh, in mainstream Hinduism and the incarnation of God concept in uh, in Christianity. There are many many theological differences. Here we are taking the big picture, the wide angle view of everything. So some religions say that God incarnates, that uh, avatar. In Hinduism, many, many times, the ten avatars of Vishnu, but not just ten avatars, there are many, many avatars, endless avatars. Uh, Sri Krishna takes Arjuna to uh, this vast and ancient tree and he says, look, it's a berry tree, uh, blackberries. And so he asks Arjuna, look, what do you see? At first it seems to be these uh, bunches of blackberries hanging in the tree. He says, look closely. And the Arjuna says, oh, they are all Krishnas. Every little berry is a Krishna. There are thousands and thousands of Krishnas. What it means are there, asankhe avatara. That means innumerable avatars in the past. And they will come in the, there are many, many more to come in the future. And in every, every cycle of creation. This is um, the uh, Hindu view. In Christianity also, the incarnation of God is accepted. That Jesus is not... Uh, just a rabbi is just not another prophet is actually the son of God and uh, he says I and my father are one in the sense of the incarnation um, the word made flesh but then Islam does not at all accept that God can ever be incarnated Judaism does not accept God can be incarnated they can be a messiah but it's not literally God uh, who comes in Buddhism you don't have a God at all there's no question of the incarnation of God. But the point is, in all these religions, there are special and unique personalities. That's the most general form of the question we can find. Um, in Islam, Prophet Muhammad is regarded as a human being. Though a prophet is a messenger of Allah, is a human being. Uh, well, certainly not an incarnation of God. And yet, even in Islam, in, in the most orthodox Islam, you will find the Prophet Muhammad is regarded as a uniquely perfect human being, but uniquely perfect, special, specially commissioned by, by the Lord. So not just like everybody else. So there is a uniqueness about the Prophets. The Prophets of Judaism, there is a uniqueness about them. They were not only very devout, just every devout Jew is not a Prophet. They were uniquely inspired by God. Um, so, whether it is the avatar of Hinduism or the incarnation in Christianity or the prophets of the other Abrahamic religions or the Buddha concept in Buddhism, is a human being but a very unique in, uh, human being. Everybody can ultimately become a Buddha. Actually, depending on the Hinayana, the, the Theravada and the Mahayana, in the Theravada ultimately everybody can become enlightened, achieve Bodhi enlightenment and Nirvana, freedom. That's called Arhat, the enlightened. Uh, in the Mahayana, that's only on the way. Ultimately, everybody is a Bodhisattva, uh, who is like a Buddha in, in a seed form. And ultimately, in the long run, everybody can actually become a Buddha. So, there can be many Buddhas, but the Buddha is unique. So, this is the point I'm trying to make. There are unique personalities, avatars, prophets, um, great masters or buddhas uh, in every religion. There, there must be. These are the founders of religion, the great spiritual leaders of humanity. The rest of us, all others, we can, we can aspire and we should aspire to become enlightened. So the language that he has used that Ramakrishna and Buddha, they were enlightened beings, uh, they were also enlightened beings. No, enlightened beings, all of us can be and we should be. We should try to become enlightened. God realization is the goal of human life, everybody's goal. Uh, but avatars, everybody cannot be. Everybody cannot be a prophet, nor should we aspire to be. That would be madness. <laughs> all right. Now, as I said, the textual interpretation uh, is that 
the uh, last prophet and the seal of the prophets is Prophet Muhammad in the Abrahamic line. That's one way of looking at it. There are other ways. I'll give you some options of looking at it and see what, what appeals to you. That um, the after such each such unique advent, when a prophet comes or an avatar comes or the Buddha comes, there is generally a circle of imitators immediately afterwards. And that happens. And that happens a lot in India too. Avatar is rare, but in India there is a profusion of avatars. So some of them may be genuinely spiritual people whose devotees want them to be avatars. I want my guru to be an avatar. Maybe the guru never claimed that, but the devotees. Some are not at all um, genuine, some might be fraudulent. So to prevent that, a clear message has been given that this is the last prophet. And those will come afterwards, they may be very pious people, very spiritual people, mystics, but don't regard them as, as prophets. So that might be one interpretation. In Christianity, for example, um, Jesus says, none comes to God except through me, uh, comes to the Father except through the Son. So what does that mean? In a narrow way, it's interpreted as only through Jesus and no, in no other way. But you can actually, if you look at it carefully, it could just mean Jesus as identified with, with Brahman, with, with the ultimate reality, with, as God. So none comes to enlightenment, none comes to salvation, none comes to freedom except through God. No, by no worldly means. Mm. By no other means. Except through God. That is true. Mm. Or in a very practical, narrow sense. You see, when Jesus is teaching, when the Prophet Muhammad is teaching to the narrow circle of devotees in those days, 1400 years ago for the Prophet Muhammad, 2000 years ago, more than 2000 years ago for, for Jesus, in, in that area, in that time, period of time in history, and that conjunction of time and space, there is no other genuine teacher. There is none like that, and they know very well who they are. So that's expressed as only here, only through this. Sri Krishna says the same thing in the Bhagavad Gita. And today, in late 19th century, Sri Ramakrishna, if you look very carefully, he says the same thing. He says, go where you will, but you will, know, you will find no genuine religion except what is here. What does it mean? In this conjunction of time and space, at this time, the most powerful, the, most, the easiest access to God is through the, the current avatar or the incarnation. That's what it means. Okay. Uh, this question is from Krunal P. Atman being the Purna has no need to do anything. Ego being inert cannot be the doer. Then who is the doer? You have taught us that there is no relationship between Atma, Purusha, and Anatma, Prakriti. Then where does Prakriti get the power to perform its work? Does Brahman have power or is Brahman power itself? In other words, it's intrinsic quality. If it is power, what is the need for Brahman to have or be this power when it has no need to do anything? So many questions. Each of them could be a talk. <laughs> yes. So once you study Vedanta, very soon you will come across this question. Who is the one in delusion? Who is the doer of actions? Who is the one who is, the, who is suffering? If I am Brahman, I certainly can't be in delusion. I certainly can't be the doer of actions. I am not born and dying and going through the cycle of birth and death. And it can't be the body either. Because the body is born once and dies and it's, it's an object, it's, it's a machine like all other machines. It's, uh, uh, it is not going to attain God realization. It's, uh, uh, it's just a thing. So which one? The most philosophical form of this question is, who is under delusion? If I am Brahman, Brahman can't be under delusion. And the mind or the body are just inert, they are objects. They can never be uh, free. Then who is under delusion? Who is the doer of actions? So this question is, uh, Shankaracharya answers this in, uh, more than once. In the Bhagavad Gita, the 13th chapter in his commentary to the second verse, I think. Shankaracharya is faced with this question. Somebody asked the question, uh, then who is under ignorance? 
meaning thereby if I am Brahman, then who is under ignorance? Like saying, um, can the sun be in darkness? Impossible. Who is under, under ignorance? Shankara's answer there is very interesting. I can give you the same answer. Shankara's answer is, who is under ignorance? Um, why are you asking? The questioner says, because I don't know, that's why I'm asking. Then you are under ignorance, you just admitted it, I don't know. <laughs> you said, I don't, I don't know, that means ignorance, you don't know. So you are under ignorance. But I am Brahman. But if you know you are Brahman, then you are not under ignorance. So the thing is, the who is under ignorance is paradoxical. It can't be an object, it can't be Brahman, but it's a peculiar mixture of object and subject. It is Brahman, under the limitation of body-mind. How can Brahman have body-mind? It doesn't, but it's under the uh, delusion that I am this body and mind, and then it becomes a jiva. In identification with the body-mind complex, the same Brahman becomes a jiva, becomes or becomes within quotes appears to be a jiva and does not know itself and therefore thinks, I am in ignorance. I must find out who I am. What's the whole point of life, the goal of life? Uh, what is the truth about myself? I don't know these things. Ignorance. So the jiva, the answer, direct answer to your question is, the jiva is under ignorance because uh, then immediately the answer will be, but you taught us the jiva is Brahman. If you know that, the question does not matter. One Swami said, on this side we have the question, but not the answer. On that side of enlightenment, they have the answer, but no question. <laughs> so the, there is no direct satisfactory answer to this. And that's the way it should be. If there was a direct satisfactory answer, who is under ignorance, then it would be a real question with a real answer. That means we are really under ignorance, but we are really are not. Uh, it's a kind of... Um, magical state where we seem to be under delusion but we really are not under delusion we really are Brahman now uh, could you repeat the second qu the second part of the question about um, Prakriti and uh, then where does Prakriti get the power to perform its work does Brahman have power or is Brahman power itself if it is power what is the need for Brahman to have or be this power when it has no need to do anything Right. Let me answer this question um, in two phases or two stages. One from a Sankhya perspective. Why? Because you are using the term Prakriti. Where does Prakriti get the power to do activities, the impulse to act? Prakri prakriti is nature. So the Sankhyan perspective is the ultimate reality is that there is nature, material nature, time, space, matter, energy, all of that. And our bodies, even our minds are part of material nature according to Sankhya, which is something that would be perfectly acceptable to modern scientists. The whole thing, body, mind, everything is part of nature. But there's one difference. According to Sankhya, consciousness is not part of nature. Consciousness is, uh, is an independent entity which interacts with nature, becomes entangled or appears to become entangled with nature and becomes this jiva, this body-mind complex. It, it is identified with this. But is in its real nature, it's called Purusha. Purusha is pure consciousness. It's an immortal awareness. And there are many such Purushas. So the, the answer to the question is that in the Sankhyan system, Prakriti is capable of acting but has no purpose of its own. It's just dead nature. Uh, dead in the sense it is, it is all power but uh, it has uh, no purpose of its own. And consciousness has meaning, purpose, value, uh, can give that, but it cannot do anything by itself. It just shines, it just is, like light. So the example that is given in Sankhya is, there is a person who can see but he's lame, can't walk. There's, he sees where, where he wants to go, but he can't go there because he's lame. And there's a person who can walk around, but is blind, doesn't know where to go. How do they, then what, what happens? The answer is, the uh, blind man takes the lame man on his shoulders and the lame man who can see tells the blind man, go this way, go that way, and they both reach their goal together. So all activities done by nature, but illumined and guided by consciousness. This is the answer from Sankhya perspective, from the Sankhya perspective. Power, energy, activity, dynamism belongs to nature. Consciousness 
belongs to uh, or is the very nature of purusha and that consciousness lends purpose meaning value to the activities of nature what does nature and uh, do for consciousness nature they say prakriti provides bhoga apavarga it provides experience in life to consciousness everything that is happening to us is provided to us think of yourself as awareness just as awareness you can have no experience only when awareness shines upon nature prakriti that there is a body and a mind and an external world then you can have experience you eat and you drink and you talk and you work and you fight and you love and you are born born means bodies are born illumined by consciousness you are born and you grow and old die reborn all of that is nature illumined by consciousness which is identified with the body and mind this is called the whole drama of life as one word in sanskrit bhoga bhoga means experience pleasant unpleasant and then what happens when the soul embodied soul that purusha embodied in in a particular subtle body provided by prakriti through the spiritual journey life after life sees its uh, uh, real nature uh, evolves spiritually and then wants freedom from limitation that is called apavarga it's a very ancient word for moksha apavarga freedom freedom from limitation then prakriti provides that also for the embodied soul for for the purusha uh, brings it to uh, philosophy and spirituality and religion and shows it the path to freedom and prakriti itself provides freedom to uh, purusha so purusha gets both bhoga and apavarga um, worldly experience not just one world many worlds experience many lives experience and when the purusha is ready for it prakriti itself sets the purusha free through a spiritual process all philosophy meditation uh, everything is part of that experience vedanta the second phase of the answer is vedanta in vedanta all power prakriti is identified with brahman why in vedanta in advaita vedanta there is only one reality it's not two realities prakriti and purusha uh, nature and consciousness no consciousness is also existence is a crucial point in vedanta advaita vedanta consciousness is also existence chit is also sat sat chit if consciousness is existence then the existence that you find in prakriti prakriti is very existence the existence of the nature of of this universe that is also uh, brahman or purusha now the word for purusha is becomes brahman brahman is existence not only of itself but it's also the exist it lends existence to the universe so the universe cannot be apart from brahman no more than a wave can be apart from water or this table can be apart from wood wood lends existence to the table clay lends existence to the pot and gold to the golden ornaments similarly brahman not only illumines not only is consciousness not only is aware of prakriti but gives existence to prakriti so prakriti is not apart from brahman there it, the name now becomes purushan is now called brahman and prakriti is now called maya now the question will be he asked but brahman is ever fulfilled what need does brahman have of power it doesn't you will th- therefore see in advaita vedanta the maya of aspect of brahman the power aspect of brahman is downplayed ultimately in advaita vedanta non dual Bra- vedanta the only reality is brahman not brahman and maya brahman and maya is called saguna brahman god there you have god and the universe and individual beings then there is a role of power of shakti maya is also called shakti prakriti shakti maya same but is that the ultimate reality no the ultimate reality even beyond god the ultimate reality is beyond god beyond ishvara jagat jiva god universe and individual beyond that underlying that is the one reality called nirguna brahman the absolute so does the absolute have power no so absolute is powerless it is beyond having power because it is absolutely fulfilled it does not need why do you need power i mean one place swami vivekananda says the presence of power contrary to our understanding the presence of power is a sign of weakness is a sign of limitation 
I want something. I want to cross this river. The bird evolves wings to fly across. It's a power. Why? Because it cannot cross just by you know, thinking about it. It's, it requires some way of crossing it. We evolve the power of thinking and working and we build a bridge across it. We have this power. But that very power shows us the limitation that we need to cross this uh, river. There is something yet to be accomplished. We are as yet incomplete. And for completion we need power. So that existence of power shows, shows the lack of completion. Neither Brahman, Saguna Brahman, Ishwara or God or Nirguna Brahman actually needs power. They're always fulfilled. Saguna Brahman has power for the benefit of the rest of us, the jivas, for creating this universe for our benefit. Not that Saguna Brahman needs the universe or us, or power. In Nirguna Brahman, there's no question of universe, there's no question of the jivas also. There's only one reality. So ultimately, you're right. Nirguna Brahman is self-fulfilled, does not require anything, and therefore there is, um, I won't say there is no power, because power also depends, Shakti also depends on Nirguna Brahman, but Nirguna Brahman does not need Shakti. Yeah. Uh, this question is from Tan Moy S. What is the Vedantic approach to the Anatman of Buddhism, and what was the main logic that Shankaracharya used to override the Buddhist approach of Anatman? Big question again. <laughs> yes. This is a perennial question. When you study Vedanta, you are told that you are the Atman, not the body, not the mind. And this Atman is uh, existence and consciousness. And an eternal existence and consciousness. And if you are that eternal existence and consciousness, then you are not subject to birth and death. It does not come and go. You are free of death, you are free of old age, you are free of illness. All sufferings. One has to realize that. Now immediately the question will come, but the parallel philosophy which developed in, in India, like, along with the Atman theories of Hinduism, Sankhya talks of an Atman, it calls it the Purusha. Yoga talks of the Atman, calls it the Purusha. Nyaya and Vaisheshika and Mimamsa and Vedanta, they all talk of the Atman. Yeah. In Kashmiri Shaivism talks of an Atman, calls it the Shiva nature. And in parallel developed this entire uh, Buddhistic philosophy. Jainism also speaks of an Atman. But the entire Buddhistic philosophy which says there is no Atman. In fact, belief in an Atman is the, is the problem in the Buddhist philosophy. Seems to be just the opposite. Here you are asked to believe in and realize that you are Atman, not body and mind. There you said, give up all these belief in Atman in a permanent... Uh, see, the Buddha, the Buddha teaches that there is no uh, Shashvata, there is no eternal self. And also teaches that there is it against uh, nihilism, Uchedavada. That means nothing is there. No, that is also not the teaching of the Buddha. There is an eternal, eternal self and there is no self. No self means um, nihilism. Eternalism and nihilism, let's put it this way. Sashvata vada, Ucheda vada. Both of these are denied by the, Buddhas, Buddha, by the Buddha. So the Anatma theory of the Buddhists um, is, uh, what they say is, it's directed against the empirical self. This is the short answer to the whole problem. This is directed against the empirical self. Just as in Vedanta it says, you are not this particular body and mind. You are not the Sthula Sharira, Sukshma Sharira, Karana Sharira. You are not the physical body, the gross body. This, you are not the subtle body. You are not the causal body. I will not define these terms. We have already talked about it many times. Sthula, Sukshma, Karana Sharira, Vilakshana Atma. You are none of them. You are the Atman. You are not the physical sheath the so-called food sheet, Annamaya Kosha. You are not the vital sheet, the Pranamaya Kosha. You are not the mental sheet, the Manomaya Kosha. You are not the uh, sheet of the intellect, the Vijnanamaya Kosha. You are not the sheet of bliss, the Anandamaya Kosha. You are the witness of all these five sheets. The Atma is uh, Pancha Kosha Vilakshana Sakshi. Witness of this. What Buddhism is saying is, suppose you just go halfway here. You are not the physical body, subtle body or causal body. You are not the five sheets. And, and nothing more. Just stop there. You will get the Buddhist Anatma theory. 
ex- saying exactly what the Vedantist is saying, uh, denying that we are this body-mind complex. Buddhist also is denying. They do a very, very thorough job of denying that and showing how we cannot be this body-mind complex. They, instead of talking about the three bodies, they have a different way of anal- analyzing it. In Buddhism, there is the Panchaskandha, the five composites or the five pillars of the call it the five um, heaps. There is the physical body, there is the, the samskaras, the memory, the mind stuff, and there is uh, sensation, there is understanding, and there is a kind of awareness. Uh, not the pure consciousness, uh, uh, but the awareness which we feel right now, which Vedanta would call chidabhas or reflected consciousness. They call it the Vigyana Skanda. And they show the Atman, the self, so-called Atman is none of them. It can't be any of these. And then, that's it. If you thoroughly realize this, you realize the Anatma nature, that I am none of this ever-changing bundles. A bundle is another English translation of Skanda. The five Skandhas, the five bundles, which appear to be me, they are not me. What am I? Don't ask anymore. Just realize this thorough emptiness of these, that I am, these five are empty of self. Once you realize it, that is freedom. After all, you think there is a self which is suffering. It needs to be free of suffering. I have shown you, there is no self which is suffering. That's it, suffering is gone. And the whole point was to overcome suffering. They make you disappear then there is no problem. It was your problem. You don't exist anymore. So where, where is the problem? Problem can't hang in the air. This is a very oversimplified way of putting it. Now the question he asks is, how did Shankara uh, refute the Buddhist objections? Yes. Uh, yeah. And what was the main logic that Shankara Chari used to override the Buddhist approach of Anatman? Yes, uh, Shankara Acharya attacks the Buddhist Anatma theory in a number of places, especially in his Brahma Sutra, commentary on the Brahma Sutra, a commentary on the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, um, number of places actually, Shankaracharya in many places attacks the Buddhist. Specifically, see there were multiple schools of Buddhism, broadly four, Sautrantika, Vaibhashika, Vigyanavada and Madhyamaka. Uh, among these, the Vigyanavada is pretty close to Vedanta. It says that there is no self, what we take to be the self, the reality is that there is a stream of consciousness. So nowadays in literature you speak about stream of consciousness novels, but this idea, this phrase was used nearly more than 2000 years ago in ancient India, stream of consciousness. What they say, just like a river flowing, millions of droplets of water flowing together like a river. There is a stream of consciousness which is flowing and which appears to be a self. So. Uh, the one instant of consciousness arises with its content and then it dies. Then another instant of consciousness arises with its content and then it dies. And then another instant, moment to moment, flashes of consciousness are there. And each consciousness, each flash of consciousness reveals a particular thing. So you have a cup of coffee. So you see the coffee. Flash of consciousness, gone. There's nothing more. Another flash of consciousness comes up when you smell the coffee. Another flash of consciousness is the warmth of the coffee. Then another flash of consciousness is the taste of the coffee. Now, we go a little deeper. What they are trying to say is, in each of these flashes of consciousness, these are cognition instants, uh, in Sanskrit, kshanika vijnana, momentary consciousness flash. In each of these flashes of consciousness, there are two aspects. One is, I, and the other one is the object. So, I see the coffee, flash of consciousness. The other one, I taste, taste of coffee. There is, a, there is a subject element to it and an object element to it. And these are separate, discrete. They're coming and going. Now, it may all sound weird and strange. Not at all. Actually, if you sit quietly and, and watch your... Uh, uh, inner experiences, you will see it seems very much like a stream of um, of cognitions. I hear this, I smell that, think of this and remember that and want this and uh, suffer this and again hear something. And that's how it's going on. Whole life is just like that. A stream of flashes of consciousness. Absolutely a, a, a pretty good 
description of our a minute granular description of our day to day life moment to moment life not even day to day moment to moment life now where does this illusion of a self come according to this vigyanavada buddhists why i'm saying vigyanavada particularly because this is where shankaracharya con- concentrates his most fierce attack so that was the question what logic does shankara use so the vigyanavada buddhist says in all these flashes of consciousness there is a subjective element and they j- taken taken together these subjective elements taken together give the impression the false impression of a permanent self i flash i flash i flash so i i smell coffee i taste coffee i t- uh, i see the coffee i feel the warmth of the coffee and it gives an impression of these flashes of i-ness they gives an impression of a continuous i there is no continuous self but it feels like there is a continuous self because of just like when the fan is going round and round it looks like a disk but actually these are three blades which are moving very fast and they, it looks like a disk another classic buddhist example is the fire brand when you take a uh, like a po- pin point of fire and whirl it around it looks like a shiny a uh, fiery circle when you whirl a fire brand around but there's no circle it's just one point of fire being sur- being whirled around in a circle so in just flashes of consciousness they give rise to the feeling that there is one permanent awareness there isn't even modern neuroscience would be something like that after all there literally are flashes of uh, light going on like bursts of electricity all the time um, thousands millions of those little bursts of electricity almost like what the vigyanavada buddhists uh, talked about 2000 years ago and all these um, you now the, the stunning thing which they claim is so but there is a cup of coffee outside no those objects in each flash of consciousness they give rise to the illusion that there is a separate object that there is a constant cup of coffee outside there is a thing called coffee and a cup outside no there are only the contents of this consciousness within consciousness appears smell sight sound taste touch and the illusion of a cup of coffee that to outside that to a body all this sense of solidity and permanence none of it is real they are all appearances in consciousness they are no more real than the flickering pictures on a movie screen here the screen is inside in consciousness flickering consciousness is the only reality yeah that's a good way of putting uh, vigyanavada buddhism its more modern form is prevalent in tibet they called it the mind only school it speaks for itself It's self-explanatory. Mind only school. There is only mind, and nothing else. Mind is the series of consciousnesses. Is the mind. That's it. There's nothing else. That's the only reality. So, if consciousness only or mind only is the reality, it sounds pretty close to Advaita Vedanta. Why would Shankara be mad at them? Precisely because it's very close to Advaita Vedanta. It's not quite Advaita Vedanta. There is a big, big difference. What is the difference? In Vigyanavada Buddhism, consciousness is momentary. It flashes in and out of existence in a continuous stream. Advaita Vedanta says consciousness is unchangeable, absolutely unchangeable, undecaying, no question of being born or dying. It shines uh, eternally. Let's put it that way. That Buddhism. the vigyanavadis did uh, deny the vigyanavadis also recognized that vedanta is pretty close to uh, their theory in fact one of the last masters in india um, before the buddhist philosophy faded away shantarakshit and kamalashila uh, at about 1000 ad or so 1000 years ago they by that time advaita vedanta was pretty well developed and they knew about these things about vedanta So when they read Vedanta their comment on it was alpa aparadha Vedanta has a small fault other buddhist schools completely rejected uh, the hindu schools that there is a permanent self but when it is presented in the form of non dual vedanta that there is an uh, ever present consciousness and everything else appears in consciousness the buddhists thought hey pretty much like us except 
that these fellows say that consciousness is unchanging and eternal it can't be like that there are certain very subtle reasons why consciousness they say it cannot be continuous and unchanging so it has to be flashes of consciousness that's why they say vedanta has alpa parada alpa parada means a minor fault just a little problem you need to fix that hey you are one with us and the vedantins also say that shankaracharya is particularly um, uh, annoyed with the vigyanvadi buddhists how can brahman the pure consciousness be a flickering light so what was the logic many things that shankaracharya said let me share a few with you um one is this whole concept of um flickering instance of consciousness he asks how do you know that once we observe that there are flickering instances of consciousness the question would be who is observing those flickering instances of consciousness notice if consciousness instant 1 comes and goes it cannot be aware of the next consciousness consciousness instant and the consciousness instant 2 cannot be aware of the preceding consciousness instant because it's gone already the consciousness instant 3 has not yet come so the, the consciousness instant 2 cannot be aware of the third one and similarly so each discrete flash of consciousness would not be aware of anything preceding it and anything coming after it how would this illusion of a so called illusion of a self develop if each is an independent flash of little consciousness in fact you are right that the mind is experienced in this way you experience the movement of your mind in this way a series of flashes you just need one more question there to whom or to what are these series of flashes appearing actually you see what's happening here is in the vedantic analysis the buddhist has not yet completed the drig drishya viveka thoroughly it's still a mixture of mind and consciousness there that's why the buddhist feels the flickering of the mind is the flickering of consciousness yeah. flickering of the mind is not the flickering of consciousness mind is always flickering these are called vrittis movements of the mind it's always flickering but flickering the flickering of the mind is seen or illumined by what consciousness is it is that consciousness itself flickering no if it was how would you know and the one which knew that would that be flickering so this is one argument it doesn't work the, the buddhist uh, the, the flashes of consciousness and there's a very intricate uh, discussion on this buddhists have their replies and so on um are there other arguments yes one big argument which shankaracharya gives is you are saying that there's nothing outside it's all inside and the fe- that it feels outside is an error the here i am and the world is there outside it's an error it's actually all in consciousness Here Shankaracharya uses a strange argument which seems to go against Vedanta itself. He says, "How does the idea of outside ever appear? In dreams, you have a feeling that I am walking around in the park. The park is outside me. I am walking in the park. But when you wake up, the whole thing is inside you. Fine. But the idea of outside in a dream has come from our waking experience, where there really is an outside. I am here, and the world is there outside." So how does this idea of outside come to you o oh, the vigyanavadi buddhist who you who in your waking experience also there is no outside waking dreaming it's all the same because all in consciousness try to appreciate the force of this question uh, of this doubt you're saying there is no outside you the buddhist are saying there is no outside as such it's all imagined the outsideness is an error but how can there be an error unless you had experienced it for yourself at some time the rope is mistaken for the snake because you have experienced a snake then only you say oh this is that's like the snake i saw and or this is a snake but if you had never ever experienced a snake how would you think that the rope is a snake the concept of snake itself wouldn't be there how do you know that how do you why do you make the mistake that the world is outside although it's in consciousness if there were really no outside yeah. as you can imagine the buddhist also will have some answers to this but this is another thrust another uh, uh, charge against the buddhist another uh, objection possible objection i don't know if shankara gave this objection from an advaitic perspective would be if there are flashes of consciousness 
each with its object. If there are flashes, a flash means it comes and goes, and before the next one comes, there must be an infinitesimal gap. There must be a tiny gap. Then only you can call it a flash. One has come, gone, next another will come. In between, a tiny gap must be there. That's why we call it flash. A tiny gap of darkness. You say, so? How will that gap be known? Between one flash of consciousness, one bit of knowledge and the other bit of knowledge, between that, that is a separating gap, how is that known if consciousness is not there? And if that consciousness is there, then that cannot be a flickering consciousness because it saw the first burst of knowledge, then the gap, then the next burst coming. This, this flickering chain is, is coming. The presence and absence of knowledge, the presence and absence of knowing, like deep sleep, for example, a gap. You, Buddhist, you want to quieten the mind in meditation. That quietened mind where there are no more flashes of consciousness, what knows that, flash, uh, that quietened mind? So there must be consciousness. And if you say there is no gap, one flash of consciousness, next one there is no gap. So you, if there is no gap, then you can't call them flashes of consciousness. It must be one continuous consciousness. There is no way of escaping this. So these are some of the objections. Now we cannot credit Shankaracharya alone with these uh, refutations of Vijnanavada Buddhism. It's a vast topic. There are books and books written on this. Before Shankaracharya, there was the great Mimamsa, Purva Mimamsa uh, teacher, Kumari Labhatta, who uh, refuted Buddhism very thoroughly. For example, he wrote a book called Niralambanavada. It's a part of his much bigger book, one chapter. It's a refutation of the Buddhist idealism or this Vijnanavada we are talking about. It's a refutation of that. The word Niralambanavada means, um, Alambana means support. Nira, Niralambana means without support. And Vada means the view. The view that all our experiences are without support. What does it mean? Our common sense idea is that there is a clock outside. And this is the support for my experience of a clock. Based on this object, I am having an experience of a clock. I am seeing a clock, holding a clock. So this is the alambana, support. What is the Buddhist saying? There is no clock outside. The experience is all that there, there is. Uh, they say there is a slogan, Nilo Taddhiyo Abhedaha. The blue and the experience of blue are indistinguishable, are, are identical. There is no such thing as a blue thing outside. It's just my experience of blueness. Similarly, it's only my experience of a clock. Like in a dream, suppose you experienced a clock, you saw a clock in a dream. When you woke up, you realized there was no such clock actually, it was all in your mind. All you did was experience a clock without an actual clock outside. So, Niralambanavada means that there is no object outside and yet without any support we keep on experiencing. And this whole view of the Buddhists is critically examined by Kumari Labhatta. Actually, he is criticizing a, a great, one of the greatest Buddhist um, philosophers, Vasubandhu, who lived a few centuries before um, Kumari Labhatta. So why do you know so much about this? I wrote a paper on it at Harvard. <laughs> Uh, a critical examination of uh, Buddhist idealism. Actually, I discovered a very nice little book. It's called Sanskrit Debate, a slim volume, by William Allen uh, Curry. Uh, he, as I discovered, he was actually he's an alumni of, of Harvard many, many years, decades ago. He wrote this book, which was published by Peter Lang Publishers in 2015. The name of the book is Sanskrit Debate. And it's a very exciting little, slim little volume. He first explains the whole Buddhist position of Vasubandhu, that there is no external universe, it's all in flashes of consciousness. And then he refutes the whole thing. When you read through Vasubandhu, the, his presentation of Vasubandhu, you are convinced. The whole thing is a dream. And then you read Kumarila's refutation of that, you are convinced. The whole thing is real. And he has written it in a very racy, it's like a reading, a, reading a thriller, in a slim volume. Kumarila's arguments, <laughs> very nice arguments, for example, um, against the Buddhist idealist, against the Vijnanavadi, uh, is um, 
how so we are debating you are a buddhist i am the hindu the mimamsaka we are debating proponent and opponent i say the world is real you say the world is an illusion all right if the world is an illusion where is the difference between the words of the proponent and the opponent your opponent whom you are debating must be a figment of your imagination must be within your consciousness there is no real opponent apart from the experiencing consciousness whom are you debating <coughs> the po position of that opponent is your own position is it not so suppose you met a great philosopher in your dreams and you debated fiercely and then you woke up next day you realize oh all those arguments which i gave were my own arguments but the opposing arguments which were given by that philosopher are also my own arguments because there is a part of my own consciousness so where is the difference between your position and mine if everything is part of your consciousness only one argument <laughs> um he says karma because he is a mimamsaka very important karma is very important so you buddhist you believe in karma action and its result but if everything is in consciousness then where is the reality of action where is the reality of its results what would one act for if everything is within oneself what is one acting for why wouldn't one just sit around even in your consciousness just sit around in consciousness <laughs> what would be the point of action if there's no nothing apart from consciousness to be gained at all neither action exists apart from consciousness nor its result exists apart from consciousness so on so he has some very nice uh, arguments against the vigyanavadi which shankaracharya picked up actually yeah can we take one more question yes this is from hasharaj b i have a two part question oh oh <laughs> <laughs> here we go is the reflected consciousness the same as pramata and can we consider reflected consciousness as an amalgamation of vijnana maya and ananda maya okay reflected consciousness is in sanskrit chidabhasa so i am pure consciousness awareness and by the power of maya mind appears within me within awareness itself and in the mind consciousness is is i the consciousness am reflected there so the mind in the mind there is awareness and it feels aware and through the mind the awareness is shines upon the senses and through the senses to the body and through the body and the senses it experiences the world which is also a creation of maya within consciousness so this is the vedantic picture now his uh, his question was um is the reflected consciousness uh the same as pramata 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 means knower the one who knows so when you say i know a cup of coffee i am the knower of the cup of coffee i am pramata so the reflected consciousness when it uses sense organs like eyes or taste tongue or smell or touch is a knower uh, or it uses the mind to infer is now the knower when it uses the instruments of knowledge so the reflected consciousness using the instruments of knowledge is the knower yes pramata but my answer is yes but i also know that you are going to misunderstand when i say this why the the temptation is to take the take ourselves to be the reflected consciousness you see at a stage when we are unable to know ourselves or the clarity is not there that i am the witness consciousness this is not a living truth for me i'm still very much i feel like the body and mind and i know some theories about pure consciousness and all but i don't really honestly regard myself as pure consciousness the most i can do is think of myself as consciousness as this awareness i feel in the mind that's the most i can do and that's the reflected consciousness so the so the subtlest thing that vedanta speaks about to my knowledge is that reflected consciousness the witness consciousness atman brahman seems to be theoretical to me if it was not theoretical i would be an enlightened person you see so the temptation is to take myself to be the reflected consciousness that would be a mistake you are not the reflected consciousness you are that which is being reflected it's like I go out in search of my real face. I've been told that I have a real face. I have a face. I'm, I want to experience my face. Finally, I get a fine mirror 
shiny mirror and I see my face reflected there and I say, ah, I've got it. Here is my real face. It's so nice and shiny. See, it's my real face. But no, it's not your real face. Uh, it looks exactly like your real face. It's a very good likeness of your real face. But it's still a reflection. Your real face is here. It's not there. The problem is the real face it cannot be seen. It cannot be objectified. The advantage is it's real. The reflected face, the advantage is it can be seen. You can see it. But the disadvantage is it's not real. Take the mirror away, the reflection is gone. Turn the mirror around, the reflection is gone. Make the mirror dirty, reflection becomes dirty. Make the mirror concave or convex, the reflection becomes grotesque. The reflection depends entirely on the mirror. It's not real. It's, it is not, it's not really your real face. Similarly, <coughs> the, the um, temptation is to take the witness, the, the chidabhas, the reflected consciousness as I. You know what the subtle um, uh, temptation is? Okay, now I've got it. I am this reflected consciousness and I have to realize there's some Atman, Brahman, witness consciousness, absolute, something like that is there. I have to find that. It's like saying, I am this face. Now there is something called a real face. I have to look for that. You are not this face. You are this. Only because of this that is appearing. You are the witness consciousness. Because of you the reflected consciousness is appearing. You know it is as true, it is actually true to say that you the witness consciousness are also the knower, the pramata. It is you reflected in the mind which appropriates to itself the functioning of the mind and the senses and then see, says, I think, I remember, I understand, I see, I hear and smell and taste and touch, the pramata. Who is that? Reflected consciousness, true. But the reflected consciousness is also nothing other than the real consciousness, that is the witness consciousness. So in one sense, indirectly, you, the witness consciousness, the Atman, is also the Pramata. It may go against what you are reading in, in the Vedanta textbooks. But textbooks are help, just means to help you to analyze and they label. The danger of labeling is, unless we already have the clear knowledge, if you have the clear knowledge, you are unfortunately or, or fortunately you are already enlightened and you don't need the textbook. But when you need the textbook, we are at a stage where we are unfortunately not enlightened and we know only part of the truth. So that part of the truth which we know, we know the mirror and the reflected face. And we try to think that's the reality. No. The reality is here. <coughs> I, the consciousness, am being reflected on the mind. It's like, let me end with this uh, um, example very beautiful example. The earth at night is illumined by moonlight. True or false, if there is a moon, full moon for example, it illumines the earth at night. Moonlight. True but also false. The sunlight reflected from the moon is illumining the earth even at night. It is the sunlight alone which is reflecting, which is which we are labeling as moonlight. And there is a reason why we label it as moonlight. What is the proof? Suppose the sun were not there. Yeah, sun is not required. Moonlight is illumining the earth. If the sun were not there, would the moonlight illumine the earth? No. It wouldn't. When the moon is blocked by the presence, by the earth, and it, it does not reflect sunlight, notice there will be no moonlight also. Yeah. Eclipse will be there. Moon does not reflect sunlight then. So it is, even when we call it moonlight, it is the sunlight only. But what is the problem? The problem is, at night, we see only the shining moon. We don't see the sun. We don't see the source which is hidden. Similarly, all our activities which are going on, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, thinking, understanding, all those are going on we say, ah, reflected consciousness, that must, that's actually nothing, it's like the moonlight. The real light is you, the witness consciousness or Atman. Which is like the sun at night is not seen, it's not obvious there. But without that, 
Without the sun, there would be no moonlight and no illumination of the earth that night. Without the witness consciousness, there would be no uh, reflected consciousness, and no awareness in the mind, and no experience of thinking, willing, doing, uh, the, the knower, pramata. There would be no pramata at all. So really speaking, ultimately, pramata depends on not only reflected consciousness, but reflected consciousness also entirely depends upon its source which is the witness consciousness. Don't be confused by these labels. They're meant to help you to understand, not to make you stumble over these labels or to grasp at them. Remember, the truth is simple. Who is the witness consciousness? You. Who is the pramata or the reflected consciousness? You actually. And the body and the senses and the world outside. Ultimately you as Brahman, it appears as you. You appear as all of these. So, Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. This is what all these labels and structures and concepts are pointing. It's pointing towards you. <coughs> Did you have a question, Bill? Yes, uh, I have a practical question. I will repeat Bill's question. Yes, go on. How could his question is about karma? Bill is asking, by the way, Bill is 96. Uh, and he's asking, how could 400,000 people have died from the virus at the same time as part of their karma? I mean, it sounds uh, incredible. By the way, Bill got the virus, the coronavirus, and he recovered. <laughs> yes. So thank God you have good karma and you are with us because of your karma. How could they have all have the same karma to get the virus and die more or less at the same time? What other explanation can there be? Chance? <laughs> random? Chance and ran or, or randomness is no explanation at all actually. It's just saying that we don't know. Um, or a god, because God wanted them to be, the, that God would be a devil. So I'm Vivekananda said, I could have designed a better universe. <laughs> so, is God responsible for all the evil of the world? Or are we responsible at some point? So if we are responsible, it leads directly to the, the law of karma. See, the mo if you ask why, you're asking a causality question. You're asking for, why is the grass wet? Because it rained. Why did it rain? Because there were clouds. Why are there clouds? Because of evaporation due to the sun's heat. So why always you're asking for a cause? You need an explanation. Explanation is always you're asking for a cause. You see an effect, you ask for a cause. You see an effect. So many hundred thousands of people um, are dying of the pandemic. You're asking why? Now there is a material explanation. It's, we can give um, because of the virus, because of international travel, because of the spread of the of the virus. But you said no. But there are many people who survive. Many people uh, who get the virus and survive. Another person doesn't get the virus, uh, well, gets the virus and does not survive. Some are old. Some are young. Some have pre-existing conditions. Some don't. Uh, this still remains the the uh, question why. So karma is the best possible explanation because it is causality itself, cause and effect, cause and effect. Cause and effect is at the heart of scientific explanations, whether it's the physical sciences or biological sciences, medicine, or in, in soci uh, sociology and economics, it's causality, it just becomes more complex. Now in moral life, good and bad, right and wrong, should we apply causality? Is there causality there? If you say no, causality is something physical in this world, in society, in life, in biology, in physics, only causality, and not in our moral life, then you would have an exception to the universal rule of causality. 
And if you apply causality to moral life, it becomes the law of karma. But yes, Bill is right in one sense. It includes an element of faith. Because cause and effect in science, the exact linkage can be found out experimentally, observationally. But in law of karma, what I did in my past births, if they were past births, and how they are causing the uh, suffering in this present birth, where is the link? At least we don't see it. We cannot find it. So that, that much amount of faith is involved in this law of karma. Of course, from an Advaitic perspective, they would dismiss the law of karma also. They would say, Virus, body, illness, death, all of it are appearances to you, the consciousness. What are you? So with that question, we will end. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu Please stay well. I pray to Sri Ramakrishna, the Holy Mother, Swami Vivekananda to bless all of us and to protect all of us. <laughs>